Hello, my name's Jim Lucan. I'm with the Gupta College of Science at Coastal Carolina University. And today we're going to be talking with Dr. Dan Abel. He's a professor in the uh, Department of Marine Science at Coastal Carolina University. And he's also currently Distinguished Honors Faculty Fellow at the HTC Honors College at Coastal Carolina University. Dan, thanks for being with us today. Yeah, thank you. It's a tongue twister, isn't it? Yes, yes it is. <laughs> so um, I've known you for a while. Um, actually, I've known you for a long time. And uh, as long as I've known you, you are the shark guy at Coastal Carolina University. So um, uh, one of the things that I have a personal question about or what I want to ask you about is why are people so fascinated with sharks? Well, I mean, I, I'd like to rephrase that. Why aren't why isn't everybody fascinated with sharks? But uh, there's a lot of reasons. Um, you know, one of the reasons I like to think is that they ha they're so diverse and they have such cool adaptations and understanding their evolution and their, and their importance in marine ecosystems should make us all be interested in them. But I think probably the real reason, probably one of the best reasons I've read other more, you know, more expert people talk about um, the issue is, um, is that we humans like their monsters? We like things that we fear. So why we, you know, why, you know, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and you know, it, it, it was so popular. And Stephen King novels are, you know, popular. So we we gravitate towards to, towards monsters, things that scare us. And you know, when you're along South Carolina waters and you're about to step in at the beach, and you can't see anything but this these this murky water anything could be down there, right? It should, could be the, you know, a big uh, megatooth shark, megalodon, or it could be a hundred other sharks like bull sharks and lemon. Well, it's not true, but that's what we think when we go in the water. When something bumps into our leg, then, oh gosh, you know, I, it was a shark, obviously. So, <laughs> so that's, that's the main reason we, you know, we, 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 we gravitate, gravitate towards things that we fear. So I know personally, you know, I'm sort of fascinated with sharks, but I've had a couple encounters where fascination has actually quickly turned to fear when the encounter was just a little too close for comfort. So uh, that that's always there. So uh, uh, what? So personally, when did you become fascinated with sharks? As a kid, like many of our students, um, and I would like to say it. You know, it, it wasn't something that happened in the outdoors, and that's partially true. But you know, it was early on watching Jacques Cousteau videos. He did one called Shark, Splendid Savage of the Sea, and a book by that name as well. But then I remember going fishing with my brothers and seeing a shark come out of the water near Dewey's Island, north of Charleston, and just how mysterious and gorgeous the animal was. And, and that, that really made me gravitate, gravitate towards, you know, towards sharks as a, as a subject matter. Um, but I think like, all of us who are marine, marine biologists or biologists in general, we just love the diversity of life. And so, uh, you know, if it hadn't been sharks, it could have been polychaete worms. You know, it could have been any number of, you know, it could have been jellyfish, but sharks just happened to be what I settled on. And then um, the more I get to know them, the more interesting they became as a group. I think that uh, what you just said there, that's, uh, that's true for a lot of biologists. The, uh, it has to start with that personal connection at some point in time. It could be plants, it could be animals, it could be anything, but it has to start with that, that personal connection that can lead to, a, to, to, to bigger things later on. So, um, so I know you've, you've been monitoring sharks in, uh, in Winyaw Bay and other places for a very long time. I've actually gone out with you a couple of times on your monitoring trips. So in such a, such a huge estuary like Winyaw Bay, um, just tell us, you know, how do you go about doing this monitoring and, and how do you, you know, go about designing some sort of process where you can, you can get a handle on these sharks that occur in Winyaw Bay? Yeah, the, the research almost conducts itself. <clears throat> um, you know, Winyaw Bay is just a wondrous ecosystem. Most people don't realize that it. it's one of the gems of the planet here. It's just 25 square miles. It's, it's a moderately large estuary. Um, with a relatively big watershed. In it, people are surprised to find that maybe 12 different kinds of sharks are swimming at any one time. <clears throat> and, 
And when, when I first got to Coastal in 1994, um, not much was known about the shark fauna of Northeast South Carolina. And there were some people at the Department of Natural Resources that did some periodic censuses, but, um, but research was begging in, in this area. So um, we began using a simple tool to catch sharks, something called a long line, 500 feet long with 25 branches called gangens with baited hooks on them. And you can set them in various different configurations. The hooks can lie on the bottom. They can drape from the top of the water column to the bottom. They can go diagonally across. But anyway, they, they sit there for 30 to 45 minutes. And, and we began using that tool to understand when sharks arrive in Winyar Bay and when they leave, because there aren't permanent resident sharks in the bay. Um, at least we've never been able to establish that. We want to know which habitats in the bay they live at, how, how 12 different species divide the habitat, right? They can't all coexist in the same area at the same time. Um, they may have to have different areas in the water column or different times where they're active or different food sources. And so we began using long lines to catch sandbar sharks, Atlantic shark nose sharks, black tip sharks, black nose sharks, uh, lemon sharks, bull sharks, scalloped hammerhead sharks, fine tooth, oh, on and on. Um, and then we began to, to develop a longer term census. So to understand changes in these populations over time. And then finally, we have when graduate students started becoming a thing at Coastal Carolina, we started asking all sorts of questions about um, conservation in, in, in sharks, uh, understanding population levels, where, when our sharks leave, where do they go, where do they migrate to, uh, the distribution population structure in, in sharks, uh, what age groups of what species are present and absent. Uh, all within the bay. And then we, you know, we can extend it to North Inlet to the north. And we looked at human impact in Merle's Inlet to the north. A few, very few sharks in Merle's Inlet. Um, if you want to go to a place where you're unlikely to be bitten by a shark, but more likely to be gotten by the bacteria in the water column or hit by a jet ski, go to Merle's Inlet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, you know, looking at um, the effect of magnets on sharks, we've studied um, individual recognition in sharks, how sharks can recognize each other. They like, they, they prefer members of their own species to other kinds of sharks. So we've done a lot of different kinds of uh, studies in Winya Bay and beyond to understand the basic biology and ecology of sharks there. So I know you've had huge numbers of students who, who come fascinated about sharks. And I know you've, uh, You've sort of opened the gates and, and welcomed them in to get involved in, uh, in your shark research. So, uh, so when, the, when the students come in, um, so, so how, do you, how do you let them get involved and what do they end up doing? So, you know, I wish I could spend most of my time introducing our students to wondrous Winya Bay and the shark fauna and, and the terrestrial areas surrounding it and all the other interesting organisms in the marine environment. Um, unfortunately, there's limited space on, on our boats, but I always try when, I, when a freshman comes in and comes by my, my office and says, you know, I, I came to Coastal to study sharks. Um, I wanna get them on the boat as soon as possible because the benefits to that student's entire career here are huge and not always tangible, but they perform better in the classroom. They know what they want to do with their lives. Even if it turns out it's not with sharks, they, but by focusing on one thing and understanding how a big group of passionate people work on it, then they think they, they maybe get an idea what they want to do with their lives. So, so we get them on the boat as frequently as possible. Um, once they've come on a boat with us and they've learned how to handle a shark, how to set the long lines, how to comport themselves on a boat properly. They become valuable to us and we call them. We, you know, this, when this project started, it was run entirely by undergraduates. Now I have you know, 10 graduate students or more. I lost track of them. <laughs> but, um, but the undergraduates still play pivotal roles on our, on our cruises. And, and you know, I teach a, a shark course in Bimini, Bahamas that I take 15, 16 students down to the 
to, to this Bimini Biological Field Station where we study sharks there. I teach a summer course in shark biology and a fall course. And so somewhere along the way, our students can find their way on, onto a boat. What I tell them, be persistent, but be patient, right? Keep, keep letting us know and we'll get you out there. Right. Well, like I said, I was, uh, I was on one of your shark catching trips and it was uh, pretty impressive. 15 students sort of all all running around with their jobs and uh, sort of handing off the jobs. It was, it was pretty impressive. Um, so um, I'm a conservation biologist myself, and I, and I know you probably are also, and I know you've done a lot of work with sustainability. So uh, with these top predators in, in Winyah Bay, so when we hear a lot about, you know, some of the, the bad things happening worldwide with shark populations. So so what are some of the conservation issues that we face with sharks just here in South Carolina? Well, first of all, most of our sharks are migratory. So it's important that we understand and conserve them here, but we also need to work to make sure that wherever they're migrating to, um, that there are effective conservation measures taken. Um, among the things we've done here is, is, is do the very first principles kind of research to understand the demographics, that is the population levels of animals in the bay. And as climate change is, is exorably gonna change the, the bay, we're gonna start seeing um, changes. You know, we're, we're already seeing, we think signatures of sharks migrating here earlier and leaving later because it stays warmer here. Temperature is one of the factors that determines when a shark comes and when it leaves. Um, we're, you know, it's important to understand that, but for other reasons too, because the watershed, that is the area that contributes to the water in Winyah Bay is big in South Carolina. It's largely agricultural, but it's being agricultural, but it's being developed and industrialized and it's going to have an effect on, on the animals in the Bay as well. And then as, as, you know, sort of an ancillary kind of thing, I've got studies, students who have studied, um, using magnets as shark repellents. And you might wonder how is that conservation oriented, but one of my former students, Craig O'Connell of the OCs Foundation, Dr. Craig O'Connell is frequently on, on, on Shark Week, um, is innovated a smart hook that can, it's still in the testing stage, but it can, it has a potential maybe to catch the targeted fish, say a mahi-mahi or, or, or a tuna or a swordfish, and reject the shark that accidentally bites it and dies and is of little use. And so that's, you know, one of the big issues facing shark populations is commercial fishing, but not only targeting the animals, but animals that are caught as bycatch. Sure. Yeah. You know, in drift nets that are, or, you know, that are um, ghost nets, for example, too, that are, that are fish that are still actively fishing, even though they've been abandoned. And of course, finning is still an issue. Um, there's not much of a shark fishery left in South Carolina. I think there's a small one, a slightly larger one in North Carolina. Um, but the good news is scientists know how to manage fisheries these days. And so by having, um, by monitoring and having quotas and having fishers who are compliant with these regulations, who understand it's in their best interest to keep these populations high, there, there can be some sustainable fishing of, of, of sharks. Unfortunately, that's not being done worldwide. And, you know, with all the other insults that humans inflict upon sharks from habitat, to, habitat destruction to pollution to climate change, ocean acidification associated with climate change, overfishing, um, you know, exotic introductions, a lot, you know, sharks as a group, like all organisms that live in our oceans are, are under threat. Sure. It's, uh, it's very important for the, the work of the scientists to, of course, feed into that policy development and, and then those policies sort of emerge based on science. That's uh, it's something seems so obvious, but uh, maybe um, not as common as we would like to have it happen. Yeah, you know, I, I had one occasion that, that serendipitously turned out correct. This was back, back maybe 10 or 15 years ago, and there was a shark uh, finning bill in the U.S. Congress. And Representative Henry Brown of South Carolina was the chair of the Natural Resources Committee. So I called him and I spoke to one of his aides and he was hold, apparently holding the bill up um, because he didn't see a need to, to, you know, to pass the bill. And after a long conversation with, with the aide, 
Um, Nate called me back the next day and said, well, he's decided to release it from committee. And I think it yeah. went under law. So it's rare that you have those kinds of um, impacts. But of course, one of my students, um, Brian Keller, former master's student, now Dr. Brian Keller works with National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, did the same thing um, with the South Carolina legislature to, to, to have a bill considered and passed for um, you know, shark, an anti-shark finning bill. Yeah, that's great. So, uh, so I know you have a, good, a new book out, and uh, the, uh, the title of it is uh, Shark Biology and Conservation Essentials for Enthusiasts, Educators, and Students. So, so tell me, what is a shark enthusiast? Well, what do they look all, like? <laughs> the, the title would have been a lot longer if I got to put all the, all the groups that I want wanted to buy the book. Um, all the other good titles were taken. So that was the only one that was left. So, um, no, I, when, when, when my colleague at, at Florida State University, Dean Grubbs, one of the finest shark biologists ever to, you know, to, to put on a mask and snorkeling fins, uh, when we decided to write, write a book, um, there were a lot of scholarly books out there and there were a lot of coffee table books and field guides, but there was nothing that we could use for our classes in shark biology. So we decided that we would write a book that fit what we call that sweet spot between those two extremes. And at the same time, we thought, well, you know, there's a lot of people out there that watch Shark Week that really want to know more. You know, they, they don't simply watch vi um, videos. They, they're interested in this. And so we thought, well, let's, let's expand the book to, to make it available. And that's what those enthusiasts are. These are, these are you know, these are shark and, you know, you can call them shark psychos if you want. Um, you, know, they're, 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 you know, the people that come to the coastal in one of major marine science who, who just care about sharks and want to know more about them. And so um, the book is doing fairly well on, on, on Amazon um, and you can get it from Johns Hopkins University Press. Um, it's not inexpensive, but compared to textbooks, it might cost $200 these days for class. Um, it's, it's under 50, and if you can find a used copy, it's probably around 25 or 30. I was going to say, you can probably tell those shark enthusiasts, they're the ones that have something about shark in their email name, you know, like shark well, boy or shark well, girl. Hey, you know, the, the, the <laughs> you can always come in and show me their tattoos. I don't know. <laughs> there you I go. <laughs> the <laughs> true enthusiast. Yeah, they, you know, they, they, and they always have their favorite shark tattoo to, on their ankle or their arm. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know and, and more power to them. I mean, you, you know, the, the, the future of ocean conservation is theirs. And the more they care about these things, even if, you know, if, the, if uh, you know, a lot of our shark biologists don't like dolphins. You know, they 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 consider them shark food. But um, but all you know, all seriousness aside, they, as long as you care about something and act on that and and work to make you know to make the oceans habitable by everything that lives in it, um, you know, what's wrong with that? Great. All right. Well, Dan, thank you for taking your time to do this. Um, I always like it when I learn something new, and, and, and I did indeed learn something new today. So uh, good luck with the monitoring program, and uh, thank you again for joining me. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks again.